Great. Hello. This is Jim Davis from Reed Smith. This is Emily Garrison from Reed Smith. And we're here today to talk about hurricane disaster relief and resources that folks can look to to get aid and help as they're recovering from a natural disaster. Uh, we've recently been in Texas witnessing the destruction from Hurricane Harvey and expecting similar uh, destruction from Hurricane Irma soon. And we thought it would be helpful for lawyers and uh, clients and individuals to have an idea of where to look uh, for resources, particularly on the web um, after a natural disaster. Now, one of the first questions everyone has is do they have the right insurance uh, when they're facing a significant disaster event? And there are three types of insurance that we think about right away when uh, deciding whether the types of, of loss that we see, flooding, wind, uh, storm surge, that type of, of damage, is it going to be covered by my insurance? Uh, and the first type of insurance that we see is automobile insurance, which fortunately has a type of, of coverage called comprehensive uh, insurance that, that covers automobiles for things like flooding and wind. Uh, so for example, in Hurricane Harvey, we're seeing that even though about half a million or more cars were nearly completely submerged, uh, most people, almost everyone, had a mandatory requirement to have automobile comprehensive coverage. That's enough to pay for their, for their car. Um, but it's different when it comes to people's homes and home dwellings. Emily, why don't you describe the two types of insurance that a home might have uh, for a damages from a natural disaster? Oh, sure. So um, your home would likely have um, the two types that you would have if you had them would be flood insurance or homeowner's insurance. Flood insurance um, is a specific type of policy that is issued um, by the National Flood Insurance Program, which is funded by FEMA. Um, homeowners who have mortgages on homes in floodplains would be required to have this type of insurance on their home. Um, the limits of the policy are pretty standard. They are, um, the form policy generally covers up to $250,000 to repair or replace real property and $100,000 to repair or replace or personal property, um, things in your home such as furniture um, or appliances. Um, the other type of insurance that might apply is your homeowner's insurance. Now this would cover types of damage other than floods, such as wind, um, which is common in certain types of hurricanes, not as much in Harvey, but um, looking forward, some of the hurricanes that are headed towards uh, Florida will likely um, cause some wind damage. Um, the claims for each type of policy should be made um, under the terms of the policy. Make sure even if you're not sure if they're covered, even if you think something, even if you have any questions, to make claims under both types of policies to ensure that um, you get your notice in on time and that your insurer will um, go ahead and send an adjuster to your house to start um, adjusting the loss. And what we find is that many people buying uh, flood insurance think that they're buying it from their regular homeowner insurer. So they may see the policy being issued through State Farm or Allstate, uh, but it's actually the flood policy being issued through the National Flood Insurance Program uh, through their own insurer. So they may hear that the adjuster that's coming out is a FEMA adjuster. When they use the term FEMA adjuster, they mean that they're coming out to adjust the flood insurance. Um, if the, if you, if the flood adjuster is coming out, you may also need to ask for an adjuster to come out under your homeowner policy. So for example, uh, if you have sewer backup, uh, wind damage, other types of damage that, that the flood coverage is not intended to cover, but the homeowner's coverage is intended to cover, 
you want to make sure that the adjuster from the homeowner's coverage is also out there uh, to see the property. And this becomes important later because we have sort of a, of a hierarchy of aid available to disaster victims. And one of the things that they may need in order to get certain types of aid uh, is a denial letter from their insurers, or at least a letter explaining the scope of what those two insurance policies are going to cover. Um, we also have found that flood insurance is bought individually at a uh, level necessary for that home. Um, so they don't always have $250,000 of property coverage, which is the maximum. Sometimes it's 135,000 or 175,000. So you need to look at your policy to see exactly the extent of your coverage. And one thing we're finding is that it doesn't necessarily cover everything for its replacement value. Can you talk about that? Sure. So the standard form flood insurance policy, um, uh, again, there's the two pieces. There's the real property and the personal property um, coverage that, that is available or may be available. Um, the, the way the policies work is that for the real property, things like the foundation, your house, the policy will cover the replacement value. And that would be the amount it is required to pay to replace that portion of damaged um, real property. On the other hand, personal property is um, replaced on a um, actual cash value or depreciated value. So, you know, for example, if your sofa is 10 years old, um, it, you will only be able to recover under those policies the depreciated value of the sofa um, now, not what you bought it out 10 years or what it would cost to buy a new sofa. Um, that is true for, again, the personal property in your house, um, appliances, as well as um, uh, wall coverings, rugs, uh, furniture, those types of things. So you uh, will expect to see from your adjuster or your insurance company when you eventually um, receive information about what they will agree to pay on the claim, they will only p pay the depreciated value of your personal property. So what that means, and, and there's, if you go to the FEMA website, which is www.fema.gov, there is a number of uh, links to resources explaining uh, and answering a lot of questions. And one of them is how the National Flood Insurance Program is supposed to work and a summary of how the coverage responds. And uh, there are, as it turns out, certain types of, of real property, such as carpeting, um, that, are, that are also treated on a actual cash value rather than a replacement value. So it would be helpful to look at that to give yourself an idea of where you're going to have a gap between what the, the actual cost to you of replacing uh, or repairing and, and what you're going to get from that insurer. So what we're finding is that in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, people are scrambling to clean out their homes and for example, in the flooding instance, they're trying to get all of their furniture out, carpet up, drywall up to six feet, because importantly, the National Flood Insurance Program and your homeowner's coverage are not gonna cover mold that, uh, that arises after a disaster unless there's an extenuating circumstance. So people need to get in and, and get that part of the work done. The National Flood Insurance Program um, insurers will provide people with an advance to help pay for some of those types of uh, activities, $5,000, $10,000 usually, uh, but you have to ask them for an advance and, and make sure that uh, in order to do that, you're making a prompt claim and, and getting an adjuster out to your place. Um, so then the next step after that is the question, well, how long will it take for the insurance company to adjust the claim? And we're finding that, you know, especially in a disaster area, you can't expect to get a response in seven days explaining exactly what they're covering and not covering. You're gonna hear a lot of things from the adjuster on the spot. Um, that's not the final word. What the adjuster says is, is just sort of a preview. You're, you need to wait until you get that letter explaining your coverage and the amount adjusted and what they're going to pay. 
And it's at that point, uh, people ask us, do you have to just accept what the insurance company does? So what kind of advice can we give for people that are faced with that first initial letter? Sure, sure. So um, taking one step back, um, Jim mentioned, you know, to, to start um, your repairs as soon as possible to make sure that you're uh, mitigating any potential um, mold damage that could cause, um, be caused by the flood. And our advice while you're doing that is to be taking pictures and documenting all of the efforts that you're taking. Um, that is because if the adjuster doesn't have a chance to get out to the house until, you know, after you've started the, um, the renovation and repair and replacement process, um, the adjuster won't, you know, won't have seen the damage, um, it, you know, right after it occurred, um, won't know exactly what steps you're taking. So um, while you're going through this process, we recommend, you know, taking pictures, um, you know, if you can, if you have a uh, keeping samples of carpet or floor or um, anything that you think will be helpful in ultimately determining how much um, will you, the insurance company will pay out. Um, also, um, keeping receipts, um, making sure you document um, calls with contractors or meetings with contractors. Um, everything you're doing, um, it really helps on the back end to um, really keep track of all the steps that you're taking. Um, now, as Jim mentioned, you might, you know, after you've gone through this process with the adjuster, the adjuster has come out, you've given them the information they've asked, you know, what happens if you get a letter from the insurance company and it really, you know, does not uh, cover or doesn't account for all of the damage that you occurred. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our advice is that, you know, you can, you can work with the insurance company, you know, to go to, um, you know, send them pictures, um, doc, you know, send them the documented information that I just talked about to explain why they've missed things. Um, you know, make sure that you're as thorough and detailed as possible. Another option and what, you know, people have been asking quite a bit is, you know, should I hire a public adjuster? Um, a public adjuster is a professional adjuster who advocates for the policyholder in appraising and negotiating the insurance claim. Um, a public adjuster will take a percentage of the recovery that you receive from the insurance company. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time can also be very helpful because they work with insurance companies. Um, they, you know, you may have time constraints, uh, you, you know, you need to get to work and, you know, you need someone to really be there and be on your side in negotiating with the insurance company. Um, one piece of advice we give with respect to public adjusters is, as I mentioned, they will take a percentage of your recovery. However, if you hire them after, um, you receive uh, the initial um, uh, information from your insurance company about what they'll pay. The adjuster will only take a percentage of what you recover in excess of what the insurance company agreed to pay. So if the insurance company agreed to pay $50,000, um, you hire a public adjuster, they um, you know, work with the insurance company to bump the claim up to $75,000 the adjuster will only take a percentage of the uh, $25,000 increase in your claim. And it's usually about 10 to 15% is roughly what the adjuster will take, the public adjuster will take. Um, that is a, you know, policyholders have, and, you know, insureds have found that to be a helpful route to go. Great. And, and uh, once you've gone through that process of trying to maximize your recovery under your national flood insurance. Uh, you've worked with your home insurer to see if there are uh, coverages there, and you've come to a landing on how much uh, money that you're going to receive. People are going to find that they often have a gap in coverage, uh, 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 could be tens of thousands of dollars to pay for the actual repair and replacement of their real property and personal property. Um, these, these policies are not covering temporary housing costs, um, and they're not covering a lot of other associated costs that you may have from a disaster, as you can imagine. So what, with that gap of, of, uh, of money, the second kind of step that you can take, and you should take right away after the disaster, is to apply for a small business administration 
disaster relief loan. Um, the SBA is tasked with uh, reviewing your you know, ability to pay a loan if you're in a disaster area, and they can extend uh, up to $200,000 to repair and replace property, uh, real property, your house, and up to $40,000 for personal property. And that's the first step that you would take after insurance to try to cover uh, a gap of, uh, of costs. And one possibility if your, if your home took significant damage is that you may have to comply with um, a different set of codes and then you're going to have expenses for that. So why don't you describe you know, the options if you are told that you have to uh, comply with codes. Sure, so um, if you have uh, flood insurance and you're told that you, know, you need to now comply with codes, there is um, an option under the flood um, insurance policies to get up to $30,000 um, in what's called increased cost of compliance coverage, and that will that thirty thousand dollars will help you with these um, uh, you know additional code um, codes that you need to comply with. Um, the policy or the National Flood Insurance Program does have some limitations on that coverage. Um, it is included within the two hundred and fifty thousand total limit, so um, you maximum limit available, so you, you would not be able to go above um, the limit on your policy for um, real property. Um, also, there's some, some additional requirements, and we, um, including that more than 50% of the value of the home has to be damaged. Um, you know, there have to be newer code requirements that need to be met. And so we would recommend going to the FEMA website. Again, they have some um, information there um, that sort of talks about the requirements for getting this additional coverage. But um, it could be helpful if um, additional code requirements, such as raising your house, um, are required. And, and usually, uh, or, or it's quite common that the code requirements uh, are a lot more expensive than $30,000. And so what you'll see is that folks will use the SBA disaster relief loan again to try to help cover some of those uh, costs that they um, aren't getting from the flood program or the uh, homeowners program. The, uh, the, the part of the SBA loan that I think people will find confusing is it's not like a normal home mortgage. You don't have to have you know, two hundred or $240,000 of equity in your home in order to get the the SBA disaster relief loan, um, they will um, take collateral. In other words, they'll, they'll, they'll file a lien against your house if you have uh, equity in the house, but you don't need to have equity in order to get the loan. So at that point, you've applied and for the SBA loan, you've made your claim to your flood and homeowner's insurance. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're total aid package from those sources, either you don't have the insurance or you can't qualify for the loan or even your loss is more than all of those combined. Um, there are FEMA resources available um, in a couple of general categories. So why don't you describe that? Sure, so there's, there's FEMA aid available um, for um, things such as finding temporary housing, um, that is uh, one that's really common. People ask about, they will um, give you um, a uh, grant, actually, not, you know, it doesn't need to be repaid to um, go towards paying rent at a temporary housing. Um, the, typically, you'll, um, when you apply for FEMA online, and we recommend that um, people just go ahead and do that as soon as they um, are able to um, get online or there's even an application now um, on your phone that you can do it. Um, the temporary housing loans um, are initially given on a one to two month basis, um, but they have been extended for as much as 18 months. Um, you can, um, and, and they will also just, um, if you give them a direct deposit to your bank, they will, you know, you'll get the direct deposit within one or two days. Um, the, F the FEMA assistance uh, per household is limited to, and this is sort of any type of assistance, including the temporary housing or, 
or other types of assistance is uh, limited to $33,000 per household um, right now. So um, in addition to the temporary housing, FEMA aid is also available to repair, replace, um, and other basic needs um, if you need to, um, you know, met pharmacy needs, um, doctor needs, you know, it's, it's um, there's a wide array of um, areas that the FEMA um, aid can cover. Um, we do uh, recommend, though, that when you get your FEMA assistance, they will tell you what it is to be used for. For example, here's $1,000 for temporary housing. Um, it's important that you do use the um, assistance for the designated uh, purpose, um, just because you know it is possible for um, FEMA to audit applicants later. Um, and again, this is another place where we recommend keeping your receipts, um, any information you can about what you use the FEMA money for in case you do end up going uh, through that audit process later. So FEMA aid becomes available when there's been a presidential declaration of uh, a disaster in designated counties. The president gives the declaration after the request of a state governor. Um, FEMA will then make available in those uh, impacted counties this disaster relief aid. And you have 60 days from the date of the disaster declaration uh, to make a claim uh, at, at, for, against the uh, FEMA fund. Uh, you go to a website called disasterassistance.gov, so it's a disasterassistance.gov. Uh, you put in your address, it then verifies that you're uh, in the disaster impacted county. Um, and then it's a very simple, straightforward application, uh, basic information like your social security number and your principal residence. And if you want to have uh, your uh, money just directly deposited, you give them the, the routing number for your bank and your checking account number. And that's important because if you're displaced, uh, they're gonna mail a check to your principal place of residence and you don't really want a check uh, rolling out there while you're in a different location. Uh, so they, so they, once they have that information, they, they assign you a FEMA number. And because there's a 60 day period to do that, we would recommend that everybody immediately um, make a, an application to FEMA um, so that you have your, your number right away. It, it could be you're not sure, maybe you're living with relatives at the first few days, uh, and then you're going to need the temporary housing assistance. Well, then you call them back and, and tell them that you know now you're going to need the temporary housing assistance. And maybe they pay you one month and you don't hear from them. Um, then you need to call them back after the month and say that you're still displaced uh, and then continue to press them to get um, further extensions of aid. There is a total cash limit of $33,000 combined between the temporary housing and all of the other needs. Um, there's also a hierarchy of whether you're allowed to even ask for parts of the FEMA aid. So here, this is when we were talking earlier about making sure that you're getting responses from the uh, home insurer and the flood insurer and the SBA. <clears throat> the, the part of the aid not involving housing requires that you have no other source of payment. You can't, you're not getting paid by insurance, by the SBA, by private donations like the Red Cross or others. It's really meant to be a last uh, resort type of, of payment. So uh, in order to prove that to the FEMA folks, you're going to need to have written communications from those different uh, entities so that you can show that you qualified. Now, usually this isn't happening on the front end. FEMA often is very quick to issue aid. Uh, so you may get an advance from FEMA, a few thousand dollars, or they may pay for your costs, but they are going to go through potentially a process that we call recoupment, uh, or they call duplication of benefits. And if they believe for some reason that you received insurance payments or you were able to qualify for an SBA loan and those were sufficient to meet your disaster relief costs, then they're going to ask you to repay the amounts and they're also going to go through a process of trying to take them back if you don't pay them, which means garnishing wages and other things. Uh, so one, that's a good reason to keep track very carefully 
of what you spent the money on that was for from the FEMA aid, and you can show that that was money that you did not receive from somewhere else. But it's also important to know that the temporary housing assistance doesn't require you to show that you could have gotten an SBA loan or that you don't have insurance. Your insurance generally will not pay for temporary housing, um, and the SBA loan is just generally a loan. So they've decided that the temporary housing assistance is not subject to any income requirements. So everybody qualifies for it if you're displaced and you need temporary housing. Uh, you can also go on the FEMA website, disasterassistance.gov, and they will show you locations such as hotels um, that you can temporarily stay in that will accept the FEMA payments, um, or also apartment buildings where there are slots available where the FEMA assistance they will take as a payment in whole of your uh, of your rent. So you're going to find that uh, that you need to do all of these steps at the front end of the process, and you're then going to have, for example, 12 months to tell FEMA what the results were of your insurance. Um, you know, the you may not decide to take the entire SBA loan, but you need to know whether you qualify for it. And, and you may want to, and you want to know that even though you don't know what your final costs are that are covered by insurance or what the final costs are for, for uh, payment. Similarly, the insurance policies may require you to, to file what's called a proof of claim, which you generally have a year or sometimes two years to file. Um, that's something that you can do down the road after you've worked out a final kind of resolution with the insurers. So after we, we go through those, those three main categories of aid, you know, we get a lot of questions from people, uh, just general questions that we thought we might uh, give some, uh, some uh, comments on. So why don't you go through a couple of the questions? Sure, sure. So um, one question which, um, you know, just to um, follow on something Jim just mentioned is a, a proof of loss. So I need to, um, a lot of insurance policies, homeowners and flood insurance policies require that you file a proof of loss. Um, the flood insurance policies has a, has a short time period to do this. It's typically within 60 days. However, um, as happens oftentimes in disasters, the FEMA has announced that it's waiving that initial proof of loss um, requirement for Harvey-related claims. Um, it may do that down the road for additional hurricane or other disaster-related claims, but um, just to be aware, FEMA has um, waived that, and that would apply to even... Um, a policy that is, you know, as, as Jim mentioned earlier in the program, um, uh, issued through your insurers such as State Farm or Nationwide. Um, there is a requirement, though, that you file a proof of loss um, if you're going to seek a supplement to the payment on the claim, and that would be a supplement if you disagree um, with the amounts that the insurer has recommended to be paid, um, or if there's um, additional damages that you discover um, down the road. Um, you know, after the initial, um, you know, you're in the middle of, of your repair replacement and you discover that there's some additional costs that weren't, um, you know, weren't uh, discovered in the, in the initial process. So if you are seeking a supplement, you will need to file a proof of loss and that um, needs to be done within one year of the claim. Um, just uh, something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, another question, keeping on the flood insurance uh, side is, you know, people are, are wondering, you know, okay, so the, the adjuster showed up, um, he finished his inspection, he left, I talked to him, uh, okay, now what do I do? Um, uh, you know, do I wait for him to come back? And um, what, what we are, are telling people is that you should, you know, go ahead and move forward with your repair and replacement efforts, um, make to the extent possible, and it's, you know, it's not always possible, but to the extent possible, make your reasonable efforts to, get two bids at least for your project. So um, when the adjuster comes back or the insurance company comes back, you can, um, you know, you can uh, have support for the amount that you paid for your projects. Um, if you have questions, you can always contact the adjuster um, about, you know, they, they might have recommendations for contractors, not, not always after a disaster because adjusters are coming in from all over the country, but it is, you, you know, keep in touch with your adjuster. There's, there's no, uh, no harm in, in you know, uh, making sure they're aware of the efforts that you're taking. Um, again, and 
I know we've said this multiple times and you know, can't repeat it enough. Just keep your receipts, keep the documents, keep any contracts, keep, you know, uh, any information that you get from your contractors. And even if it's just notes that you took after a meeting. Um, uh, you know, another question, and Jim touched on this a little bit earlier, is, you know, uh, you know, people are, uh, we're, we're finding in this sort of weeks after the disaster, um, the adjuster has, has come through um, and, you know, during the inspection maybe made some comments, uh, which are, you know, getting people worried, you know, comments like, oh, that, you know, I don't think that will be covered or, you know, this might, maybe didn't occur because of a flood. Um, we are... We're telling people don't panic about the comments that the adjuster makes. The best approach would be to wait until you get the, you know, formal written communication from your insurer. Um, at that point is when you can consider hire, hiring a public adjuster, um, which we talked about earlier, um, and also, you know, pushing back with your documentation and pictures and proof um, with your insurer. Um, and another question we've gotten with respect to flood insurance is, you know, I'm you know, the adjuster hasn't shown up. He's he's not taking my calls. He misses appointments. Um, he won't schedule an appointment. And you know, people are really anxious to you know get the insurance process going and want to um, you know get that going with the adjuster's inspection. Um, you know, in that case, you can call your insurance company directly. Um, you should have their communication information on the policy. You know, complain about the adjuster, um, explain what's going on, um, you know, tell them that you're concerned about that the delay will, um, you know, increase costs, potentially increase costs, you know, just make a record of um, the fact that this is happening. Um, and if, you know, a call is, works, if there is a way to communicate with your insurer online, you know, via an email, um, that's a good way to get the communication in writing as well. Um, uh, with respect to FEMA, I think we've, we've touched on some of the uh, questions that we've uh, been receiving, but just to sort of reiterate, um, you know, a lot of people ask, does your income need to be under a certain dollar amount to qualify for disaster relief? And again, the FEMA housing assistance program, which would provide um, things like temporary um, housing, either via um, a rent payment or possibly a you know available hotel room, that is um, available regardless of income. Um, aid for other losses such as personal property, vehicle repair, uh, moving expenses is income dependent and um, will be made on a case by case basis. Um, the question has also been asked about the you know the FEMA rental assistance that, you know, you get the assistance for one or two months, but it's going to be more than that, that you're going to be displaced. Um, again, FEMA has the ability to recertify temporary housing assistance. Um, there is a process by which they will send a recertification letter. If you're getting up against the deadline and you haven't gotten that recertification letter, um, go ahead and call FEMA, explain your circumstances, let them know uh, what's going on. Um, you know, another question we've been getting is with respect to this um, hierarchy of aid. So um, you've, you know, you've made the claim on your insurance, you've, um, you know, f uh, applied for an SBA loan, you've gotten some FEMA benefits, and then, you know, the Red Cross or a private organization or even your employer maybe has um, agreed to also give you a grant. Um, how will that impact your FEMA benefits? Um, again, this is, um, I guess, probably the fifth or sixth time I've said it, um, FEMA will, um, tr you know, in, in cases where they do audits and or um, have, you know, information that they suspect that uh, benefits weren't used for the purpose um, specifically designated, um, they, they may go through a recoupment process to um, try to get back. Um, the money that they gave, um, and, and that's another reason why it's so important to keep your records to explain that the, the money from your employer or the money from your insurance company was used for purposes other than what you used the FEMA aid money for. And so that process you might find uh, happens down the road uh, where you've gotten some kind of a recruitment or uh, 
what they call a duplication of benefits letter, meaning they want the money back. There's an appeal process where you can appeal that. I think the first thing you would do is call and try to uh, have FEMA reconsider their decision on recouping. And it might be at that stage that you're, you, you might need legal assistance. Um, if you're low income, there's a number of resources. Uh, I would go through the state uh, bar association or your local city bar association for a referral to a pro bono lawyer that's not gonna charge you to help. Uh, but that's the process. At that point in the process, it's talking with uh, FEMA, trying to get them to reconsider. Uh, and then there is a formal appeal process, which is all done in writing. There's no hearings and uh, they make a final decision about whether they're gonna recoup the benefits. Uh, similarly, at that stage, uh, you know, we, we talk about keeping records and documents of everything you've done. One thing that, that people clearly should not do is use the FEMA payments for things like paying your mortgage uh, because it's in arrears. Um, or other expenses that you're just have normal expenses, credit cards that you're having trouble meeting, because that's the type of thing that will lead to probably to, to recoupment. Um, and so that segues us to the next topic, which is, which is issues with your mortgage. Uh, many people are going to be faced with a situation where they're making a decision on investing significantly more money into their property to get it back to the condition it was in or to comply with new codes um, or to otherwise take on a, a loan from the SBA where it's, it's more than the equity in their home. And uh, and the meantime, they've still got to make their regular uh, mortgage payments. And so the first point to make is that the mortgage doesn't automatically stop just because your home was just damaged or is uninhabitable or even is completely destroyed. Uh, you still have to pay the mortgage uh, on a normal basis. Now, a, a traditional mortgage uh, may be issued uh, and backed by Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, and both of those uh, entities generally will create a process depending on the individual disaster to give relief to uh, their mortgage wars, um, so their homeowners. And that will be a process where you may need to work with them uh, and they'll give you a few months of forbearance or up to a year sometimes. Um, and, and, and they also may uh, stop eviction or, or foreclosure procedures for a period of time given the disaster. Um, with a traditional or the non-traditional insurer, I guess you would say a normal um, sorry, mortgage company. So every other type of bank that's not uh, Freddie uh, Mac or Fannie Mae, you're, you're going to have to call them up and ask for forbearance. And you need to understand how the forbearance would work. They might forbear uh, three months of payments and then they will put them on the end of the remaining payment. So essentially you don't pay for three months, they keep charging interest, but the payments get tacked on the end of the loan 10, 20 years down the line. Um, but other insurers say, yes, we'll forbear for, for three months or six months, but then they want you to make a balloon payment of all of the forbeared amount. So it could be six months of mortgage suddenly due in, in, in what's a very difficult situation. So uh, you need to be proactive in dealing with the mortgage company so you don't find yourself in a foreclosure situation. Um, and then there's one option uh, through the SBA uh, to refinance your mortgage and the SBA tries to help people who can't secure mortgages through the traditional market because of the situation they're in. People won't extend mortgages. Um, so they have a program, the SBA, to try to refinance your mortgage in that situation um, that you might want to take advantage of uh, so that you can maybe consolidate the other SBA loan and the other costs that you've incurred relating to your house. So. Yeah, um, go ahead. I was gonna, and I was going to make one other point with respect to the, the mortgage, because um, this is another thing that, um, and sort of how the mortgage payment, mortgage intersects with an insurance claim payment. So oftentimes your insurance claim payment, you know, you, you go through the whole process, you get a check, um, your mortgage company will be written as a, um, you know, it'll be a two-party uh, check with you and your mortgage company written onto the check. Um, you know, in that case, the, you have to endorse the check, but you also need the mortgage company to endorse the check. Um, and, you know, 
for, for issues related to this, we, um, we recommend looking at your um, mortgage agreement because there are different, um, different ways the mortgage company um, companies will deal with this um, and make sure you understand your rights and duties. Um, typically, for example, the mortgage, can't, mortgage company can't keep the payment and say, we're going to apply this to your um, interest or principal of your loan. Um, another thing is that your mortgage agreement may um, specifically say in writing that any insurance po um, proceeds must be applied to um, restoration or repair of the property. Um, so make sure that you're familiar with your um, what is you know included in your uh, mortgage agreement as well. Because um, again, similar to the FEMA aid, um, you know if if you know, you should, um, any insurance payments should go to um, specifically, you know, what, what they're designated for repairing and replacing um, the property. Otherwise, um, you can run into trouble with your mortgage company. Um, so again, if uh, just, you know, take a look at your mortgage documents. If there's anything you don't understand, um, you know, contact a lawyer, but um, this is uh, something to be aware of. So then a short note about tenants, uh, just because your apartment or townhouse is flooded or uninhabitable and you've been displaced doesn't uh, automatically mean that you don't have to pay your rent. Um, your obligations are tied to your lease, which you need to uh, obviously uh, read and, and understand. Uh, this is a situation where the tenant may need to work with the landlord to try to uh, end the rent, lower the rent, terminate the lease, or or kind of animically take steps to work through that process. And again, if you find that you're having uh, issues, the state bar associations will have uh, tenant resources, including for low-income people, pro bono lawyers. Um, so tenants are going to need to be proactive and not make the assumption that they don't have to pay their rent, or they may find uh, that they're subject to eviction uh, proceedings or other cost recoupment proceedings. So one of the things we see is that uh, people, uh, you know, find that a lot of their key documents, original documents that they need, um, are lost in in a, in a disaster. Um, how do they go about replacing their documents? Sure. So um, this is, you know, you you really have to sort of go on a document by document basis, but for um, you know, for, for specific documents that you're missing, there's there's online resources. Um, for example, if you've lost your social security card or you you know you don't know your social security number, you need another one. Um, you're finding that you need it to um, apply for FEMA benefits. Um, the Social Security Administration will um, you can you can reapply um, on their website, which is www.ssa.gov. Um, you know, you also may have, you know, misplaced or lost or um, somehow your driver's license was destroyed. Um, you would do that through the state of Texas um, driver's license replacement, and that is um, available on www.dps.texas.gov. In, in other states, it would be In other states, it would be similar. Um, you would go to your state, um, you know, state license. Uh, drivers um, uh, administration for um, for that and you know similar for you know vital records or um, um, anything else you need um, check on your state's um, website yeah, and I think there was a there was a, uh, the CDC was trying to help people so they created this uh, kind of a generalized website that lists all the states and then if you uh, go to that state link it will give you the location of various how to get uh, original documents. So we're talking, you know, marriage certificates, birth certificates, um, you know, uh, death certificates, kind of key documents. And I think that site was www.cdc.gov. Um, and, and from there, you can go, it's front slash NCHS. And that's the area they will have links to how to find original documents in different states. And so I think that the the, uh, the, the important thing you'll find is that even though you've lost those documents, they're all replaceable. Um, they are, you know, I think the only example is the Chicago fire in 1870 where the actual original documents burned down 
that's not the case today. You'll be able to find the documents for your public uh, entities. And um, one other point on that, too, is that um, sometimes people don't know um, or are just unsure if they have flood insurance um, following an event like this. They've you know, lost their records or can't find them or can't remember if they signed up for it. The National Flood Insurance Program has a hotline that you can call. Um, you know, if you don't know if you have flood insurance, if you don't know how to contact your agent or um, insurance company, um, and that number is 1-800-621-3362. Um, that could help you on a flood insurance policy-related questions. Great, and, and uh, just some kind of final thoughts. Uh, Hiring uh, public adjusters, hiring contractors, hiring people to help you. You know, you want to make sure that people are properly licensed in your state. Uh, so you can often check to see if they're properly licensed. Are they insured for the work they're doing? They, can they show you proof of insurance? Uh, can you get recommendations from other people that have used these specific individuals? And it, it sounds like uh, difficult to do after a major disaster and everyone's scrambling around to try to get help, but taking a little time to make sure that the people that you're dealing with are legitimate um, and have uh, successfully <laughs> performed these types of tasks in the past is really important. You're gonna find that uh, the government never asks you for money for an application, never asks you for money um, in order to apply for aid insurance companies and don't send adjusters that ask you to pay them in any way. Uh, so anyone who is coming to you and asking for some kind of payment to perform a task, uh, you should probably question whether that's a legitimate uh, uh, person or not. So, so this has been our discussion about disaster relief resources dealing with, you know, largely individual uh, homeowners and uh, disaster claims. Uh, if you go to the Reed Smith website, we have a Hurricane Harvey disaster relief resources guide that gives a lot of specific resources for the state of Texas, uh, but also these general resources involving insurance and SBA loans and FEMA and links uh, where you can find that type of information. We, um, we're providing this information as a, as a general uh, resource as is our discussion today. This isn't intended as legal advice for any individual. Uh, everybody's individual circumstance is different, and obviously you should consult your own lawyer for specific legal advice. So thank you for listening to our Disaster Relief Podcast. Thank you. Thank you.